Hello, I'm Gareth. This is Somewhere on Earth. I'm in London and we have voices from Washington in the US and, uh, well, all the way from the other side of this table because we actually have real humanoids in the studio with us as well, which is always rather lovely. So here we go. And with us for a bit of expertise. I don't know why I said that so hesitantly. I think I was just in awe of you, Peter Guest, um, coming along here to be my friend today. How are things? I think I'm sort of doubly offended at, first of all, being referred to as a humanoid and then by that. But otherwise, pretty good. How are you? <laughs> all right, good. I've started being annoying right from the beginning. Yeah, I'm all right. It's a bit, a bit of a weird one, though. I, I turned up for a meeting today, Peter, a week early. Have you ever done that? I mean, yeah. I do tend to look at my calendar, but so no, yeah. not often. I know. I looked at my calendar. It was just next week's one. So, yeah, just um, one of those meetings. I'll meet you outside South Kensington Tube Station, said the person I was meeting, and um, meet at two o'clock. We'll just work out somewhere to go for lunch. And so I was there, and they didn't turn up. And I was at the point of sending a slightly passive-aggressive email just saying, um, well, I'm here, just wondering where you are. And then I thought I'd better just double-check, go back through the emails and realise, anyway. So it's it was back in the 1990s. You actually phone ahead. I <laughs> too knew. Exactly. So that's uh, my not particularly eventful life, but it does just uh, kind of ease us into the programme. Here we go. And coming up today, we're talking about tuberculosis and neurodegenerative diseases today. And yeah, look, I know, I know, we're not a health podcast, but there are some fascinating tech angles behind these disorders. In TB, for instance, can machine learning help doctors screen for the disease just from the way that people cough? Well, the answer is yes, otherwise we wouldn't be doing the story. And also, could simply changing your banking app help to fund research into neurodegenerative disease? Well, what do you think? It's all right here on the Somewhere on Earth podcast. All right, now first, can you tell the difference between this (coughs) and this? (coughs) Yes, well, of course, they're both recordings of people coughing, and they sound pretty similar, but they're actually different, and it turns out they're different in a pretty important way. One of these people has TB, and the other doesn't. Now, not even the most uh, experienced doctors can tell the difference just by listening, but a machine learning algorithm can and With decent accuracy, we're told, the work could lead to AI screening for TB based on sound. Those coughs were recorded at the Kenya Medical Research Institute, or KEMRI, in Nairobi. And the recordings have formed a big data set for this research. And conducting the study was Manuja Sharma. She was at the University of Washington in the USA when she did this research. One of the theory is that bacteria that causes TB attacks the lungs tissue and damage of those tissues causes change in how the cough sound is produced. So because there's a change in the source, that can show up as a change in the frequency domain. Now, when we are listening to coughs, we are just listening to the sound. We are not able to identify that, oh, this is a a low frequency sound, or we can't specifically uh, identify the frequency, like our ears are not uh, adapted to that. So it's very difficult for a clinician to listen to a cough and say, oh, this is a TB cough or this is a COVID-19 cough. Right. And so, what... and so just to be clear then, so by frequency domain, you just mean the tonal range of, of the cough, a bit like a, a violin has a different frequency domain from a cello. Yes, but it's, it's a combination of different frequencies that's in the sound. Right. Okay. So yeah, it's the composition of the sounds in terms of the frequencies. Okay. And so this is where things have become rather tricky clinically then for a doctor to be able to discern just with their ears differences in frequency domain, the the, the tonal qualities, as it were, between coughs. So what got you thinking about machine learning possibly? So it was the size of the data. So what we did was uh, we captured coughs and the cough was converted into frequency domain. And what we got like a 2D representation, which is very similar to an image representation. And there's been so much done in the image classification field. And so we wanted to use some of the advances that's been done in that field and try to use that and see if we can see the difference between the different coughs. 
Oh, that's oh, that's really interesting. Okay, and so just to help the listeners and me <laughs> unpack mm-hmm. this, then because it didn't seem as if you or machine learning or doctors were getting very far with the the so called frequency domain, you were thinking, well, why don't we just change the way that this cough is represented? So we record it on different kinds of microphone. We change the way that it's represented, as it were, in the same way that you might say you can record a. A, a sound and convert it into a waveform that you can see on a screen. I know it's not quite what you were doing, but that's the kind of shift that you were doing then in order to maybe have another little crack at analyzing this, was it? Yeah, so this is exactly what we are doing with the machine learning. Rather than a human going through all the coughs that's been recorded and seeing the difference between a TB and a non TB and like, you know, manually going through it, let a model do that. Let the model see if there is some minuscule difference between that representation of a cough that's from a TB subject compared to a non-TB subject. And the reason being that we did not know where the difference is. The hypothesis is that the sound changes, but we didn't know where it changes. And so it is a vast data set to go and manually look or use traditional uh, tools to see if there is a difference. And so just to clarify, when you talk about a large data set, then what what is this data set? So we collected the cough data set at uh, Kenya Medical Research Institute, where uh, patients who had tuberculosis, as well as patients who were coughing due to some other respiratory health issues, were asked to sit in a room for two hours, and their uh, entire audio was recorded where they were naturally coughing. And uh, we used different microphones to do the recording high quality microphones that's used for uh, podcast recordings or smartphone uh, microphones as well as uh, conference microphones that's on uh, that's used for uh, 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 video calling or meetings so we collected around 33000 coughs uh, and all of that was uh, manually labeled and cleaned and ensuring that we have clean coughs with minimum background noise, both from the TB subjects as well as the control group that we had recorded. And all of that data set has been actually made public for researchers to go and try their hand and to see if they can come up with better algorithms to help solve this issue. But presumably you needed training data based on people who didn't have TB, was it? So how did you do the control group versus the experimental group? So we collected data from both TB subjects and non-TB subjects, and non-TB subjects were subjects who were coughing naturally, but because of flu or asthma or any other respiratory health issues. And so uh, that gave us a data set with two classes, essentially, right? Uh, One is uh, TB and the other is non-TB. The entire data set was used for partially for training and validation and testing. And so what did you find? We found uh, sensitivity of 70%, uh, which shows that there is there, there is a promise of a signal there. Then the other finding we saw is that the coughs that were collected using smartphones performed the best compared to other microphones, so, which was very interesting and also enables us to like you know uh, develop the low cost cough recording uh, uh, cough screening tool that we want to. So we think it has a big potential to be a screening tool. Diagnostic tool seems a little far away right now, but definitely a screening tool that can help triage patients in the peripheral clinic to understand you know, whether they need the next set of tests to be done to determine, uh, to diagnose TB or not. Also, we think not just the individual level screening, it can also help in identifying clusters of TB infection, uh, TB patients in a in an area. For example, if the app is on everyone's phone in an area and we find that cough signatures coming from this area look like TB, then that can help identify the hotspots, TB hotspots. That's Manuja Sharma. Uh, So Pete Guest, uh, definitely a good news story coming out from AI there and that um, audio analysis and uh, smartphone microphones came out of it very well too. But fascinating interview. What did you make of it? Yeah, no, it doesn't feel like it was very long ago that we were talking at quite a lot of length about the dangers of AI. But this seems like it's the flip side, right? This is the socially beneficial use case that we've been waiting for. I mean, not just the accuracy, which is... You know, if, if proven, gives doctors everywhere any tools to diagnose or at least to screen, as, as, as Dr. Sharma said. Um, something which you previously you'd need a big investment in machinery and equipment and training. 
But I think what's more interesting for me is the, the ability to roll out those tools to people who otherwise wouldn't get access to diagnosis. We mentioned smartphones. Now, you know, the potential to use a ubiquitous device like a mobile phone to record sounds and to reach people who wouldn't be able to access healthcare, wouldn't be able to access doctors. Um, taking places like Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, where TB is a huge problem, you know, hugely sort of huge impact on health, livelihoods, the economies. Yeah, that's that's enormous. Um, and again, just finally as well, mentioning that we've all just lived through a you know outbreak of a respiratory disease, and, and understanding the kind of public health benefits of being able to map and track and understand things uh, as they as they evolve. I mean, that's potentially a massive as well, isn't it? It's very powerful indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, Peter Guest here in the studio, who will also have, I'm sure, lots to say about this next item. And it's a banking platform that looks and feels like your everyday money app but it's doing something rather different. It's helping fund scientific research into the likes of climate and healthcare and indeed research into neurodegenerative diseases, as we're about to hear. Now, it's called Science Card, and CEO and founder Daniel Bereswiel joins us. Welcome to Somewhere on Earth, Daniel. Hello. And I hope it's going well for you. Uh, um, so, what is Science Card? Science Card is an e-money current account, which... Um, you can use for receiving payments. So you get a sort code account number, you get a MasterCard, you can pay anywhere. But it has a very nuanced difference to other bank accounts. It is actually designed to have genuine impact. So it enables people to have a genuine meaning to the money. It drives okay. access innovation. And then um, secondly, there is a, within the app, you have access to a um, dashboard where you can where, where you see how all the account, so the company and uh, the crowd is sponsoring scientific research. Okay, right. So you have a menu of different scientific research projects and you can say, I want the good that comes out of this app to pay for like this project here and you go and click on exactly. it. Exactly. Right, exactly. okay. And uh, like, how, how does that come about? Like, Where does the money come from in order to pay for or contribute to these different projects? So... Each individual customer has the ability to, to donate to those projects. She or he can round up on every purchase. So you spend 95 cents, you can set the mechanism that 5 cents will go into that research project and so on. Or if you particularly like that project and you would like to um, enhance the progression of that, you can contribute higher tickets. Um, there's no really a limit. Obviously, there will be, but... Uh, you can contribute 50, 100, even a thousand pounds or above. Right. So it could be in like just individual payments, just literally just click on something or you select something and then that puts, say, your chosen amount in. Or can you even do it proportionately? Could you say every month when I get paid, I want 5% of my salary or whatever to go into it? It's not an option to a percentage of your salary, All but right. it's an option to set up a reoccurring monthly payment. Sure, okay. So people can work out for themselves yes. what they want to do. So what kind of research projects are involved? So we support three areas at the moment. It's climate change research and healthcare research and quantum computing research. The first two that are on the platform are in healthcare. The first one is a project looking for a cure for cervical cancer. Um, discovering the potential of fig latex, a, a fruit from the Middle East. And then the second project is uh, the project we have here with the guest, Emot, which is a project to find a better therapeutic me method for neurogenerative diseases. All right, we've queued us up beautifully to meet Emad, who is uh, working with you. Um, so not actually at Science Card, but uh, at University College London. Um, so this is Emad Mohan Endabari, who is Professor of Cell Mechanics and Mechanobiology at UCL. And you're researching neurodegenerative diseases. So we'll hear a little bit about how you're getting some of your funding from Science Card. But first of all, what kind of research are you doing? My background is engineering, and we are trying to create engineering tools to study diseases, but also to find therapeutics. And uh, in the context of body and neuroscience, it's very, very difficult because brain and spinal cord in human are not accessible easily. And it's very, very difficult to test therapeutics on this, this kind of like diseases related to this part of body. So I'm affiliated to mechanical engineering department and uh, by background I'm mechanical engineering. But then over the last 10 to 12 years, I switched my direction of my research to biology. And uh, one of the teams that I'm currently working on is the brain and uh, brain research, basically. 
Yeah, all right. So I was just wondering what the link is between mechanical engineering and neurodegenerative disease. And So you're saying in this case it's getting access to very sensitive parts of the body, like the spinal cord, for instance, so then that you know, to then so, progress the research itself. So the trick here is like we are developing models that mimicking your brain and spinal cord. And then the problem at the moment in the research is the model that normal neuroscientists are working are far away from the real body composition and physiological function. So we are developing this model, we call it organs and a chip technologies that you can replicate the interaction of cells, uh, particularly neurons and other cells in the brain and spinal cord in these models. And we are engineering basically these, these constructs, these assays, to be able to study diseases and also testing drugs. Mm. So we are basically using engineering approaches to create the real environment that the cells are sensing and experiencing in the body. Right, so it's not in the body, that's the point. It's then. outside, yes. So, so it's on a, on a chip. So on yes, a, on a chip. So it's... Uh, in it's, silico. So it's, 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 they call it like in vitro assays. These are like kind of like more advanced version of uh, conventional in, in vitro assays that has been developed previously for years. So as I said, like conventional in vitro assays are like been developed over like 50, 100 years, but they are not replicating the real uh, physiological function of the your body. Most and and most, more, more more interestingly, the the brain is one of the most complicated, inaccessible part that with specific cells and complexity. So we are trying to create and engineer that complexity inside lab and try to understand how brain function, but also test different yeah. therapeutics that we can then test on humans. And, and the point being. That, that with that approach, it gives you more control, doesn't it? So, you know, exactly. you haven't got a patient sitting there, so you can try lots of different things out. And as you say, take an engineering approach. So how did you get involved and how did your funding start coming from these guys over at Science Card? As a scientist, we're always looking for money to fund our <laughs> research. And uh, the conventional routes that we are taking is always like... Uh, 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 research grants from government, uh, governmental funding bodies, charities, and normally this is this is like something that is known and like it, it is a very very lengthy process, super competitive, and sometimes it's very very basic research. There's not much commercialization involved and translational involved, and we are always looking for money. And then I heard about Science Card because like uh, Daniel, it used to be the same department working working on a basic. Oh, how handy that yeah. a former colleague goes away and comes up with a platform that helps to pay yes, for science. Yes, so it, it happened that <laughs> that, that worked that, out well. It happened that we were we were like working together years ago, and then uh, I don't know how I heard about it. I think we we are very very well connected in the research space in the UK. Myself, I did PhD at UCL. My co-founders both did PhD. And uh, we, we know the struggles and the pain of the scientists and uh, the importance of the work and how it's actually could benefit a lot from more funding. We, we all would benefit. Our life would be very different. All right. And uh, so, so we, we reach out and uh, then there's networking and talking and we meet. That's, that's how it goes. Ab absolutely. So, um, so, Peter, then, this is all very interesting. It's like a combination, it seems to be, of fintech, crowdfunding, scientific research. I've certainly never heard of anything like this before. No, I mean, I think Dan Daniel's could have put the point quite well there, you know, the struggles of this. And I think there's a slight tragedy that scientists are spending their time looking for money. Uh, I think this is definitely innovative. It's interesting to me. I'm clearly going to be biased on this, this point. But the idea that science is a public good, that it is something that should be funded, should be funded by the public, owned in some senses by the public, um, I think it's powerful. I might turn it back around on you, Gareth, though. I understand you have a, some interest in the subject. I mean, do you think that science is good enough at communicating its role as a public good? Oh, gosh, science is... I mean, science, of course, it is a public good. And <clears throat> public funding for science, it depends where you are in the world, I'm sure, but certainly in the UK, it is challenged and becoming increasingly challenged. And without taking this too far away from the tech, but, um, you know, we had a change of government in 2010 and that led to... Um, quite a, a dip in the science budget and there was a great big campaign people were on the streets shouting outside the treasury <laughs> in London calling for more funding for science uh, so so one might even say Daniel I'll let you come back in on this uh, in, in a second 
isn't it a shame that we even need you to be here that there isn't there aren't funding streams from elsewhere maybe more centrally so i'd have that but also uh, to to um to you emad in my university where i work i managed to get a little bit of money to help uh, some students with a, a scholarship and it was very difficult to get the university to accept that money, and for very good reasons, because the university has you know, a whole anti-fraud, anti-money laundering, anti-you-name-it. And the number of bars that need to be crossed in order for an organisation to be able to give the university money is quite a thing. So the question to you then, how, was, how were you able to convince your research institution that it was OK to take this? Not at all. It took us uh, over one year, nearly two years, to make this contract with the university to happen. And as you rightly mentioned, fraud and lots of other 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 issues, including IP, uh, the background of company. So usually, like research institutions like UCL, of course, they are so super sensitive. The money is where it's coming from, and there were lots of checks. But also, because this was a new scheme. Nobody was familiar what kind of contract it should be. And uh, to me as a scientist, of course, I want to get the money. I don't care much where the money comes from, but to to to, to UCL and government, it's important to know yeah, where deal. the money comes from and uh, why okay. the so money comes to my lab. A lot, of, a lot of forms to fill in before <laughs> they could accept your money then, Daniel. Um, so maybe I can add here, um, because I think this is a very interesting point. So... On our end, we want to make life easier for money to reach science. And so we KYC the people. We screen for money laundering, sanction list, uh, adverse media. So we make really sure for the university that the money is clean and it can be accepted with an instant. So we know of many cases where people actually wanted to give back to the university a big sum of money. And uh, then they stopped the process because they were tired after 16 months of trying. So with the Science Card app, if, if somebody's out there and would like to sponsor science at their home university, you can do it within five minutes now. That's the advancement in technology that we are providing um, and fusing fintech with science together, optimizing this flow of funds. Yes. This is very, very important because also, like, let's say as an inv individual, I cannot go to UCL and donate, let's say, 100 pounds for a research There's no such mechanism at all. You to either go to these charities or... or it's going to be lengthy process, complicated. So from 100 pound, let's say, to 100 million, million pound, it's so complicated to donate for research mm -hmm. going to this institution. So I think this, this kind of science card mechanism that they are taking care of the part that is like, where does this money come from? Who is this individual and what's coming is going to, going to make it clear and super fast for universities and other research institutions to access the money. Yeah, but it, it, but I was wondering, Daniel, could, couldn't people then, if they care so much about um, funding scientific research, it's very easy just to go and put some money in a tin shaken outside a shop by, uh, you know, somebody working, for, you know, raising money for a research charity, for instance, or even writing them a, a check, if people write checks these days in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. Do we really need the app, if you care so much about funding science? Yes, yes. So it's a great question. Um, obviously, there are charities out there, and they're very specific. Um, you have Cancer Research UK, you have British Harp Foundation, they're all doing amazing work and they are raising a lot of money and they're very effective, very established. Um, what we offer is a much broader science reach, climate change research, quantum computing research, healthcare, and that's just the beginning. Then we do this um, healthy waters, soil and all this. And that's we, we, we give bring such a deep, uh, broad depth into the access yeah. so you can even monitor in the project over the years and the progression you get very transparent updates yeah and in fact a lot, a lot of this by the way um peter guest reminds me of these apps that where you can give your mobile phone processing time to um help with number crunching in different scientific endeavors and i don't know if you've come across any of these but i have one on my phone called dreamcast for instance where you know when i, I put my phone aside at night and i can assign my phone to be part of uh, like a whole network of thousands of mobile phones that number crunch through um computer models to help come up with you know protein unfolding or whatever it might be 
coming up with drug discovery for novel cancer molecules, just big computing tasks that are farmed out to people's mobile phones. And on that, I can choose which of many projects I want to donate my processing cycles to. So Daniel's doing it with cash. I'm doing it with processor cycles. There are quite a few ways of getting involved now. I mean, I think that's a positive thing. And as Ahmad said, you know, the idea that you can make small gifts, you can make gifts that allow you to participate at your own personal level, again, feel some sense of ownership over it. I mean, I don't think I'm ever going to be in the position to be able to give $200 million to any university. You, know, not you never know. Mind. Well, <laughs> I, I really appreciate the, the intervention. Journalism really does pay that well. But... Um, but the, it, isn't, it isn't just the amount of money. money. For me, it's the idea of participation. Right? As I say, we're very distant, I think, these days from the fundamental science that feeds into the innovations and the treatments and the, uh, and the benefits that we get. And I think that the idea of getting that connection, whether it is, as you say, like, I think processing power is an interesting way of reminding people that there is an input into the things that they then ultimately benefit from. I think this is the same, right? Money, power. Okay. attention <laughs> yeah yeah sure um well we're gonna to have to wrap, wrap it up quite soon but just finally to both of you then how much of a game changer do you expect this to be i know you're both going to say it's brilliant but we need you to qualify these answers a little bit so emad why is this significant do you think as, as a professor yourself every penny that we get from any source is going to be significant and getting the significant amount of money to take our our, our technology to the next level is extremely, extremely, I would say, appreciative and impactful. Again, as I said, like it's very, very important to uh, to to understand like the current funding system is extremely bureaucratic, extremely competitive, mm. and getting any money out right, of the so system all is, funding helps. is is extremely, extremely important. But also, I hope, as we are the, one of the first projects in the science card, I hope. This process of one or two years is going to get streamlined. Other universities, other institutions can like make it smooth and everything going to be like okay. ready and accessible and fast track. Right. Finally and briefly, a few words from you, Daniel. It's about um, bringing change to how we live and um, how we actually can progress better as a society. And the way we saw it, that science is an essential part of our progression. It's so important. Finance is huge, it's very important, it's extremely powerful, most powerful thing. And our idea is that if we bring them close together, us as a society, we can greatly benefit and accelerate innovation and make a better life for us all. So the, the importance of bringing those two silos more effectively together it, it is very, it's very big and the impact you would see drastically yeah. all right <laughs> okay now one thing you may be wondering dear listener is like if you've got this uh, banking application of, of daniel's and people can just put like a few pence at a time into some scientific research there are loads of different projects projects cost like millions of pounds to fund how do the sums add up you know how is the app managing to kind of funnel enough money into enough scientific projects now, if you want to know the answer to that question, you will have to subscribe to this podcast. Yes, I know that's really harsh. It's called marketing, but um, we will get that question to Daniel in the podcast extra. To subscribe, we've made it dead easy for you because we want your money, basically. So now, if you go to our website, that's somewhereonearth.co, and it's right there on our homepage. There's a subscribe button on the left, and there's a buy us a coffee button on the right. Boom, we've made it that easy. So... Um, Folks, thank you very much indeed uh, for this section of the podcast. So that's uh, Emad Moendbari uh, from UCL and also Daniel Beriswil and uh, Pete, as ever. It's been lovely. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, email is quite good. We're still on the good old email. Hello at somewhereonearth.co. We're on social media. You probably know where to find us by now. And on WhatsApp, that's uh, code 44-7486-329-484. If you like the sound of your own voice as much as I clearly like mine, then you can uh, leave a voice note. Um, otherwise, just write us something. That's fine. Um, audio production today has been by Keziah Wenham Kenyon and Callum Swingler here at Lanson's Team Farna. Uh, our production manager is Liz Tui, the editor is Anya Litorovic, and uh, I'm uh, I'll tell you in the subscription version. See you next week. Bye-bye.